Let's go ahead and get started with Grand Rounds this morning. It's my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Isma el uh who is uh, chief uh, of our division of uh, surgical oncology. Uh, Dr. Jatoy did his uh, medical school at St. Louis University, uh, where he also received a PhD in addition to his MD degree. Uh, he then did a surgical oncology uh, fellowship at Royal Marsden uh, in England. Uh, has spent uh, 21 years uh, in the uh, Army uh, and retired as a colonel and then joined us here on the faculty uh, about, what, seven years ago, 2010? Uh, please, he's going to speak about uh, adjuvant chemotherapy with breast cancer. Dr. Jatoy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Ken. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, drug therapy for breast cancer. And, and a lot of people may ask the question, why is this relevant to surgery, why is it relevant to, to surgeons to know about drugs that are used in treatment of breast cancer? So I think the first thing that's important to emphasize is that the, the, the drug treatment for breast cancer, what we're talking about, we're talking about adjuvant systemic therapy, is given as adjuvant to surgery. So in other words, I'm not going to be talking about the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. I'm going to be directing my talk, the treatment of early disease, patients who have primary breast cancer with no overt sign of metastasis. So this is the treatment of early breast cancer in patients with no overt sign of metastasis. Now, it became evident very early on, as surgery became sort of the dominant uh, method of treating breast cancer in the late 1800s, that, that surgery alone was not adequate to eradicate the disease, that oftentimes, thank you, thanks, that oftentimes the, the people, patients recurred even though uh, you were able to extirpate the disease, get no negative uh, uh, tumor out, and get clear margins, recurrences were still very commonplace, which, which suggested that there was also a need for drugs because the disease seemed to be very systemic very early on, despite there being no evidence of, of overt metastasis. So again, what I'm talking about today is not treatment of metastatic breast cancer, but treatment of early breast cancer in patients who have no overt signs of, of uh, metastasis. Now, the other thing I'm going to emphasize in my talk today is the, the numbers game. In other words, we oftentimes give this drug or that drug and say, well, this is effective, that isn't effective. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we quantify the treatment of breast cancer, how we quantify the effects of these drugs. And this has been a particular uh, interest of mine over the years, and I think it's important that we can convey the benefits to patients, because these drugs can, all, can be beneficial, but they can also be toxic and harmful. So I think it's important as doctors, when we talk to patients about these drug treatments, that we convey, convey the benefits and the risks and help the patients make informed decisions and informed choices about which drugs uh, they may be interested in taking. And finally, the two other issues that I'm going to briefly mention. Uh, one is, I think these drug treatments have a lot of relevance to the issue of disparities in breast cancer outcomes. In other words, we're seeing more and more now a widening the disparity between African Americans and Caucasians. And I think part of this might have to do with uh, the drug tr treatments that have become available since the 1980s, and I'll talk briefly about that. And finally, I'll just touch on at the very end about screening. So as, as, as treatments become more effective, screening becomes irrelevant. As you get better and better treatments for breast cancer, you don't need screening anymore. And I'll talk about that, about why I think in the modern era of more effective drug therapy, we probably don't need uh, to put so much emphasis on screening or perhaps no emphasis at all on screening. So I want to begin, as I oftentimes do with my talks, uh, with a little bit of a historical background. So in the 1800s, there was a lot of conjecture about breast cancer. And in the 1800s, at the beginning of the 1800s, the prevailing view was that of Galen. And Galen had said, centuries earlier, ancient Greek physician, that breast cancer and all, and all epithelial cancers were systemic at origin, like diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. These were systemic problems. This was not a local problem. And what Galen had argued was that uh, the local manifestation of disease was only simply a local manifestation of a systemic problem. In other words, uh, you know, he, was, he was a proponent of the bile theory. And what he argued was that bile coagulated in different parts of the body. 
And the reason you saw the lump in the breast first was because that happened to be where the, where the coagulum first appeared. But eventually it appeared in other places as well. So breast cancer had nothing to do with the breast at all. It just happened to be where it's first presented. So that was the Galen theory, and that prevailed into the 1800s. Now, in the mid-1800s, there were two dominant figures that I think had a very important role to play in all this, and one was Rudolf Virchow. Virchow took issue with the humoral theory. He took issue with, with uh, Galen's notion that, that, that can epithelial cancers and breast cancer was, uh, was a systemic problem only, that was a, there was a humoral issue. And what he did, it, he, he did new autopsy studies in the, in the 1800s on, on patients who had died of epithelial cancers breast cancer, colon cancer, thyroid cancer, gastric cancer. And what he reported in 1866, he published a book, uh, the book was entitled Cellular Pathology. In 1866, he published a book where he reported that when patients died of epithelial cancers, they invariably had involvement of the adjacent lymphatics. So when patients died of gastric cancer, there was involvement of the mesenteric lymphatics. When patients died of thyroid cancer, there was involvement of the cervical lymphatics. When patients died of breast cancer, there was involvement of the axillary lymphatics. So in that book in 1866, Cellular Pathology, Virchow made a very, very stunning proclamation. What he argued was that the lymph nodes were the nidus for the distant spread of cancer, but cancer spread exclusively of the lymph nodes. And so about that time, an American doctor, Halstead, had gone to medical school at, uh, had gone to Andover uh, boarding school, had gone to uh, Yale, Columbia Medical School, he did a year in, in, in Bellevue, and then he went to Europe. In those days, if you were wealthy, they sent you to Europe for training. So he went to Europe for training, spent three years in Europe, and he came under the influence of this Virchow hypothesis. We don't know if he actually met Virchow, but he certainly met people and worked with people who had trained with Virchow. Virchow was alive when, when, when Halstead uh, spent his years in Europe. But whether or not they actually met each other, we don't know. But we do know, uh, because there are photographs of him with a lot of Virchow's uh, uh, disciples. So Halstead took that notion of lymph nodes being the nidus of the distant spread of disease, and he implemented that notion into clinical practice. So after spending three years in Europe, he came back to the United States, and one year later, they made him chairman of the Department of Surgery at Hopkins. Very quick rise to power. And so what he then did was he implemented this notion into clinical practice. And what he argued was if, if lymph nodes are the sole nidus of the distant spread of cancer, the way to treat the disease was to extirpate the lymph nodes along with the organ. So for the breast cancer, Halstead argued for the radical mastectomy, which is, bears his name, the Halstead radical mastectomy, where you take out the breast, the muscle, and the adjacent axial lymphatics on block. That was the Halstead uh, uh, mastectomy. So basically, Halstead took Virchow's ideas and he implemented it into clinical practice. Virchow was the architect of the notion. Halstead was the engineer who implemented that into clinical practice. Now, this is a, a photograph of the Johns Hopkins Hospital when Halstead was there in 1890. This is the kind of breast cancers that he was seeing. He saw, at that time, patients didn't, you know, we didn't have screening of Marek Moffi, we didn't have breast care, uh, cancer awareness a month, none of that existed. So patients presented generally with fungating masses. So at the time of Halstead, the majority of women who presented with breast cancer presented with fungating masses. And what people argue was that this operation had no effect on curing breast cancer. Well, of course it didn't, because by this time, the disease had already spread to other places. What this operation did do was had a very profound effect in controlling the disease locally. So Halstead's operation improved quality of life for women, although there's doubts as to whether or not it had any impact on breast cancer mortality as such. <laughs> Now, there's a, there's a huge hole in the virchow halstead hypothesis, a big hole, okay? And the big hole became apparent within about 10 years after implementing this operation. And we think Halstead knew about this hole when he died. Halstead died in 1922, and we think by that time people had told him about this big hole in the hypothesis. And that was that 30% of patients with no negative breast cancer went on to relapse and die. So if Virchow was correct, and if Halstead was correct, and if lymph, no, if, if lymph nodes were the sole nidus for the distant spread of cancer, then patients with no negative disease should not be dying of breast cancer. But in fact, as these reports came out in the late 1800s, that patients with no negative disease, 30% of them went on to relapse and die, 30% of them went on to develop metastatic disease and die. People began to question these, the, the Virchow Halstead hypothesis, but rather than retract from it, they became even further ardent supporters of it. And so there are people in the, uh, in the 20th century, when seeing this data, argue that we weren't taking out enough lymph nodes, that we should be taking out internal mammary nodes, we should be taking out supraclavicular nodes. So these super radical operations came into vogue in the 20th century. 
And what we found with these super radical operations, extirpation of the intral mammary, supraclavicular, uh, in addition to the axillary nodes, what we found with these super radical operations is that we were still getting a 30% node negative failure rate. But now more and more people were dying from the operation itself. And so the, this, the, these super radical operations uh, quickly lost favor. And it became evident that there's something else at play, that the lymph nodes were not the sole nidus of this spread of cancer. There is another modality at work. And so there are two important, uh, actually there are several important figures. Now, now and I brought up the, at the beginning of my talk that, that the adjuvant treatment of breast cancer was largely initiated by surgeons. So Bernard Fisher in the United States, who's a surgeon, uh, initiated the NSABP. The NSABP is the National Surgical Adjuvant Breast and Bowel Project. The NSABP uh, had a huge, huge role in undertaking clinical trials that addressed optimal issue, uh, optimal methods of treating breast cancer and colon cancer. Not, and, 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 and trials not only in terms of local therapy, but also the first adjuvant therapy trials in the United States were undertaken to the NSABP by Dr. Uh, Bernard Fisher as the, as the PI. So Fisher was, was, a, was a leading figure in the United States in uh, introducing the concept of adjunct stemic treatment for early breast cancer. Now, in, in, in uh, uh, London uh, was Michael Baum, who was my mentor when I was in London at the Royal Mars, and Michael Baum did the first trial looking at tamoxifen for the treatment of breast cancer, and he did the first trial looking at Arimidex for the treatment of breast cancer. So he had a profound effect in initiating adjunct therapy, uh, adjunct endocrine therapy for breast cancer. Uh, uh, so, and, and, and I should also mention, in Italy, there was Veronese, who was also a surgeon. So all, all, all three, uh, all three were, were surgeons. So surgeons have played a very, for, surgeons were, were, were the initiators of adjunct systemic therapy for breast cancer, and continue to play, I think, a very, very important role in designing and, and, and undertaking trials looking at innovative ways of treating the disease with adjunct systemic therapy. <clears throat> Now, there have been a lot of ra uh, randomized trials that have addressed the issue of adjuvant systemic therapy, and I've just listed some of the uh, landmark trials. I mean, I think the, the, the first was CMF. CMF is cytoxin, methotrexate, 5 fluorouracil chemotherapy. Uh, patients with early breast cancer were randomized to receive CMF versus not. So that trial was undertaken in Italy by Bonadon and, and his colleagues at the, uh, at the Tumori Institute in Milan. Then came the tamoxifen versus not trial. That trial was undertaken by Michael Baum and his colleagues at, at the Royal Mars and in London. Uh, and then tamoxifen versus aromatase inhibitors. Uh, again, that was undertaken by Michael Baum at the Royal Mars. And then we had the chemotherapy trials. Trastuzumab is Herceptin. And that was a huge, huge uh, important advance when that trial was published in, uh, in uh, 2000 and I don't have the year here. I guess that was 2005. For some reason, the year came up. But that was published in 2005 showing that when you give Herceptin, Herceptin is a monoclonal antibody against the epidural growth factor receptor. When you give Herceptin, you can cut the risk of recurrence in patients with herpetopositive positive breast cancer by over half. And then again, uh, permutation trial, uh, cytoxin, epirubicin, 5-fluorouracil versus cytoxin, methotrexate, 5-fluorouracil, showing that the epirubicin is better than the, than the methotrexate. And finally, the most recent trial, which I think is a negative trial, but it's been spinned by some people as a positive trial, has been this dual HER2 blockade. And again, for some reason, the year keeps falling off. But that was uh, published last month in New England Journal of Medicine. So, so, so this group, the, actually, and von Minkwitz, by the way, is a surgeon in Germany. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a gynecologist in, in Germany and Austria and South America, gynecologists uh, operate on breast cancer. General surgeons do here in the United States and, and in Western Europe, but in, in uh, Germany, Austria, and South America, it's, it's the gynecologist. Von Minkwitz is a, is a is a German uh, gynecological surgeon. So he looked at uh, two monoclonal antibodies, her, uh, per, uh, pertuzumab and herceptin versus herceptin alone, which is trastuzumab, in the treatment of positive breast cancer, and found there's a 0.9% advantage to giving the dual therapy. I think that's a negative trial because the cost and the toxicity of the, of the combination is enormous, and I think outweighs any small benefit at three years. But anyway, but, but, but the point is that our, our, our treatment decisions regarding, our, our decisions regarding adjunct therapy are not based on observational studies. They're based on large randomized trials, and the end point for these trials has generally been mortality from any cause, all-cause mortality, although in recent years, people have been going to cause-specific mortality as an end point for these trials, and I will talk a little bit about that in a second. Now, I think it's important to understand 
uh, these drugs are equally effective if they're given before surgery or after surgery. So whether you give adjuvant therapy in the neoadjuvant setting, neoadjuvant meaning before surgery, or if you give in the adjuvant setting, adjuvant meaning after surgery, they're equally effective. So you have the option in all cases of giving these drugs either before or after surgery. The, 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 the three instances where we say that the drugs have to be given before surgery are, number one, in patients who have inflammatory breast cancer. So all inflammatory breast cancers should be treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, followed by surgery, followed by radiation. We also recommend it uh, for patients who have uh, large tumor, uh, small breasts, and want to undergo breast conservation surgery. So if they have a large tumor, small breast, they want to go breast conservation surgery, we'll give these drugs before surgery to shrink the tumor down to make it amenable to breast conservation surgery, make it amenable to lumpectomy. Otherwise, these patients would have to undergo mastectomy. So in order to avoid mastectomy and potentially uh, offer the patient lumpectomy, we recommend these drugs in patients with large tumors, small breasts, as a way of downstaging the tumor and making the patient amenable for a lumpectomy rather than a mastectomy. And finally, we always recommend neoadjuvant in patients who have, who have locally advanced breast cancer. So locally, by locally advanced, I mean the cancer has left the breast and gone to adjacent sites. Either, either it's eroded in the skin or it's eroded down to the muscle. So in patients who present with locally advanced breast cancers, either eroded, the, the, the first uh, picture you show, I saw, you, you know, I showed you the lady with the fungating mass of breast. That was a locally advanced breast cancer. So for those patients, we would recommend neoadjuvant. Uh, to basically bring the tumor back down into the breast and make it amenable uh, to resection. So again, three instances where, where neoadjuvant is mandated. One, inflammatory breast cancer. Two, locally advanced breast cancer. And three, in patients who have a large tumor, small breast, and want to undergo lumpectomy. In those patients, we shrink the tumor down with neoadjuvant to make it amenable to lumpectomy. But otherwise, these drugs can be, can be given either in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting. And in fact, in most cases around the world today, these drugs are given in the adjuvant setting. In other words, they're given after surgery. Now, when we talk about drug treatments uh, today, there are several factors that come into play in deciding what drugs to give, okay? So I think it's important to understand that when we talk about breast cancer, there are two important uh, categories of factors. We have prognostic factors and we have predictive factors. Now, prognostic factors tell you the prognosis. They tell you how this patient is going to do in the future. Predictive factors tell you what drugs the patient will respond to. In other words, they predict responsiveness to therapy. So prognostic factors predict progno or tell you prognosis. Predictive factors predict response to therapy. So the progno now, all prog so, so, uh, uh, prognostic factors, so predictive factors can also be prognostic, but not all prognostic factors are predictive. So again, predictive factors can also be prognostic, but not all prognostic factors are predictive. So tumor size is a prognostic factor. The larger the tumor, the worse the outcome. Nodal status is a prognostic factor. Patients who have node positive disease have worse outcome compared to patients who have node negative disease. So nodal status is, is, is a prognostic. Tumor grade is prognostic. The higher the grade, the worse the outcome. Patients with grade three disease do worse than patients with grade two disease, worse than patients with grade one disease. So, so the grade is prognostic. ERPR status is prognostic. Patients with ER positive, PR positive breast cancers do better than patients with ER negative, PR negative breast cancers. So having, so expressing the estrogen or progesterone receptor is a good thing. It reduces the risk of early recurrences. Although, interestingly enough, patients who are ER positive have a risk of delayed recurrences that's higher than that for patients with ER negative disease. So in other words, after eight years, patients with ER positive disease continue to have a risk of recurrence of about 0.5% per year, whereas patients with ER negative breast cancers are essentially cured eight years following local therapy. So ERPR is prognostic. HER2 status is prognostic. HER2 is a uh, is, is part of the uh, uh, epidural growth factor receptor family. And we now have uh, monoclonal antibodies that target the HER2 receptor, which I'll talk about, trastuzumab or Herceptin, as it's called. So HER2 is actually a bad thing to have, but with the drug, it's actually a good thing to have because patients who, have, who are HER2 positive are very can, can, can take uh, Herceptin, trastuzumab, uh, 
which has a very, very, very dramatic effect in lowering the risk of recurrence. So whereas before the uh, availability of Herceptin, before the availability of trastuzumab, that's the name for Herceptin, <coughs> having HER2 positive breast cancer was a death sentence. But today, it's actually a pretty good thing because Herceptin is very effective in reducing risk of recurrence in patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. And then predictive factors are ER and PR. So ER predicts response to endocrine therapy, either tamoxifen or the aromatase inhibitors, and HER2 status predicts response to Herceptin. About 77% of patients in the United States with breast cancer are, have ER-positive breast cancer. 77% of patients in the United States present with ER-positive breast cancer. About 20% of the patients in the United States present with HER2-positive breast cancer. Now, in Europe, uh, I'm sorry, in Asia and other parts of the world, the, 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 rates or the, or the, the rates of ER positivity is lower, or the proportion of ER positivity is lower, probably owing to the fact that they don't screen as much in other parts of the world. So screening preferentially picks out or detects ER positive breast cancer. And we can talk about that in the end if we have a little bit of time, but, but screening preferentially picks up ER positive breast cancer. So in parts of the world where there's a lot of screening in place, you'll see very high rates of ER positive disease. In parts of the world where there's low screening rates in place, you'll see, very, you'll see much lower levels of ER positive disease. So anyway, so the point is that prognostic fact, so predictive factors can also be prognostic, prognostic factors, uh, not all prognostic factors are predictive. And again, ERPR predicts response to uh, endocrine therapy, tamoxifen or Remedex, and HER2 positive status picks response to um, trastuzumab, also known as Herceptin. Now again, uh, as I said, endocrine therapy, ERPR, 77% of all breast cancers, uh, and there are two classes of agents. There's tamoxifen, which binds to the ER receptor. It's also known as a SERM, selective estrogen receptor modulator. It binds to the estrogen receptor. And then there's aromatase inhibitors. The aromatase inhibitors block conversion of androgens to estrogen, thereby lowering estrogen levels. So these two different types of drugs have two very different effects, but they're both endocrine agents. They both target the ER positive breast cancer. Again, tamoxifen binds the receptor, and the aromatase inhibitors bind or, or bind the enzyme aromatase, which converts androgens to estrogens, and therefore it lowers estrogen levels. Since it lowers estrogen levels, and estrogen is the driver of breast cancer growth and metastasis, you have inhibition of growth uh, with, with, with either of these agents. Uh, now, tamoxifen can be given to either pre- or postmenopausal patients, okay? But the aromatase inhibitors can only be given to postmenopausal patients. Why? Well, because in, in, in a patient who is premenopausal, she has an active FSH, that is follicular stimulating hormone, uh, hormone axis. And if you block conversion of androgens to estrogen in a premenopausal patient, where you have the FSH axis in effect, uh, FSH levels will rise, and you'll basically countermand the effect of the aromatase inhibitors. So, so in premenopausal patients, giving the aromatase inhibitors doesn't work. You can only give it to postmenopausal patients. In postmenopausal patients, the estrogen is produced in the uh, body fat, the liver, uh, the adrenals, and blocking peripheral conversion with the FSH axis not intact will lower the estrogen levels, and you'll continue to get, uh, uh, and, and you'll get a lower estrogen level, which, which will lower the, uh, the risk of proliferation of the disease. So again, 77% of all breast cancers are ER positive, and we have two categories of agents, tamoxin, which is a binds the receptor, which is a SERM, selective estrogen receptor modulator, and we have the aromatase inhibitors, both are uh, effective in lowering, uh, in, in, in inhibiting estrogen, thereby a lowering risk of recurrence. Now, the other agent that uh, I was talking about is, is, is HER2, uh, is, is trastuzumab. Tr trastuzumab binds to the HER2 receptor, which is a member of the epidermal growth factor receptor families. 23% of all patients in the United States are HER2 positive and are therefore eligible for Herceptin. Now, we only give Herceptin with chemotherapy. It's never just given by itself. And the reason we always give it with chemotherapy is because in all the trials that looked at Herceptin, the trials were designed to look at Herceptin plus chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. So when the FDA approved Herceptin, they said, well, the only evidence we have is that it works with chemotherapy. So you have to give it with chemotherapy. So you can't give Herceptin by itself. It has to be given with chemotherapy because the trials were designed uh, such that the two options were Herceptin plus chemo versus chemo alone. Herceptin plus chemo proved to be beneficial over that of chemo alone, and so when the FDA approved the agent, they approved it with chemo. And finally, we have chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, uh, we have CMF, which is the original Bonadonna uh, regimen, cytotoxin, methotrexate, 5 4 We have the anthracycline-based regimens, 
which inhibit DNA RNA uh, synthesis. And we have the taxane based uh, uh, regimens, which, which uh, destroy the microtubules, thereby inhibiting proliferation. So, three different categories of chemotherapy agents. We don't really give CMF anymore. It's primarily the anthracycline based and the taxane based regimens that are used today. So, this in a nutshell are the uh, breast cancer adjuvant therapy regimens. Now, endocrine therapy, as I said, is primarily given. Is, is, or not, is, I'm sorry, estrogen receptor positive breast cancers primarily get endocrine therapy. But the question becomes, do they also benefit from chemotherapy? And there's a lot of debate in, over the years as to whether or not patients with, who are ER positive should get endocrine therapy as well as chemotherapy. Well, in 2004, the NSABP group published this report in the New England Journal, and what they said is that there are three groups of ER positive breast cancers. There's very low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And they based this risk profiling on a 21 gene assay. So they were able to use this 21 gene assay to categorize patients in either either low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And by low risk, the recurrence score was 1 to 17. Intermediate risk, it was 18 to 30. And high risk was 31 and above. So based on this recurrence score from this 21 gene assay, they were able to categorize patients into either low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And what they found is that patients in the high risk group benefited from chemo. In the, in the intermediate group, there was some kind of uh, controversy, but in the low risk group, there's really no benefit to chemotherapy. So we now have this 21 gene assay, it's called uh, uh, an oncotype, which we use routinely on our patients with ER positive breast cancer to help decide whether or not they should get chemotherapy. And you can use the oncotype score in patients who are ER positive with up to three positive nodes. So again, more on the score. So uh, the percentage of patients ER positive patients who have a low oncotype ended up in this, uh, in this database from the NSAP was 51%, 22% were the intermediate, 27% were high. So 27% of patients clearly benefit from chemo, 51% of patients did not benefit from chemo, in the intermediate group there is conjecture. Uh, and there's a trial now actually randomizing these intermediate groups to either chemotherapy or not to decide whether or not the intermediate group uh, should get the drug. So again, the oncotype, 21 gene assay, uh, will, will help you decide, make the decision of whether or not ER positive patients should get chemotherapy or not. Now, the insurance companies initially balked at ordering the oncotype. It's a $4,000 test. It's relatively expensive, and they argued that it wasn't necessary, that we, had, we already had null status and other means of deciding. But when they realized that it was reducing chemotherapy dramatically, a lot of patients were not getting chemotherapy who otherwise uh, would, the insurance companies realized that this was a potential money maker for them or money gainer for them, so they came on board. And now it's, it's, it's accepted by almost all insurance plans. And so we can get oncotype on patients who are ER positive and make decisions based on chemotherapy on the basis of oncotype. Now, so let me now get to the sort of the numbers game, okay? What's effective, what isn't effective? So as I said, Herceptin is a monoclonal antibody directed against the HER2 receptor. And HER2 receptor is part of the epidermal growth factor receptor. Herceptin is the best drug we have for adjuvant therapy of breast cancer. It's the best drug that we have. It can only be given to HER2 positive patients, which is 20% of all breast cancers. And before the advent of Herceptin in 2005, having HER2 positive disease was regarded as an awful, awful prognosis. Since the advent of Herceptin, having HER2 positive disease is actually regarded as a good thing. So we've gone from it being a bad thing to have to actually it being a good thing to have because HER2 positive patients are eligible for Herceptin. So Herceptin cuts the risk of recurrence by 55%. You take it for 52 weeks, every three weeks or 52 weeks. You always take it with chemo. It cuts the recurrence by 55%. It's a very, very dramatic effect, and it's the best drug that we've seen that we have available for the treatment of breast cancer. The next best drug we have for breast cancer are the aromatase inhibitors. The aromatase inhibitors, uh, as I said, block conversion of androgen to estrogens. They lower estrogen levels. They can only be given to postmenopausal ER positive patients with breast cancer. They reduce the risk of recurrence by 40%. Or septin cuts it by 55%. Aromatase inhibitors cuts it by 40%. But the only people that can take aromatase inhibitors are postmenopausal ER positive patients. The next best drug for breast cancer is tamoxifen. Tamoxifen can be given to either premenopausal or postmenopausal women. And it cuts the risk of recurrence by 32%. Can be given to either pre or postmenopausal ER positive patients with breast cancer. And it binds to estrogen receptor. Then comes chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is not as effective as these targeted therapies. Chemotherapy is down here. Okay, these targeted therapies are up here. 
So we put a lot of emphasis on chemotherapy, but it's actually not as effective as targeted therapies. So the best chemotherapy regimen we have are the taxane-based regimens, which destroy the microtubules. Risk, of re risk reduction is 30%. Then comes the anthracycline-based regimens, which inhibit DNA-RNA synthesis. Reduction risk of recurrence is 28%. Then finally comes the old bonadonna regimen, CMF, which has a risk reduction of 25%. So the best is trastuzumab, i.e. Herceptin, but only HER2 positive patients are eligible to receive it, and that makes up 20 to 30% of our breast cancer population. Next comes aromatase inhibitors, 40% risk of reduction, but the only patients who are eligible to receive it are postmenopausal ER positive patients. And, and, and that, of course, the majority of our patients. And then comes uh, tamoxifen. The only patients who are eligible to receive it are ER positive, PR po uh, ER positive, either pre or postmenopausal patients. Then comes chemotherapy, and anybody can get chemotherapy, whether you're ER positive or not, whether you're young or old, anybody is eligible for chemotherapy. Now, I should add one other thing about chemotherapy. Chemotherapy benefits premenopausal patients more than it benefits postmenopausal patients. So if you look at the effect of chemotherapy, it's more effective in premenopausal patients than it is in postmenopausal patients. And why? Well, the reason is because in the premenopausal patients, chemotherapy kills cells, i.e. it has cytotoxic effect, but it also kills the ovaries. Patients who are premenopausal who get chemotherapy will oftentimes become amenorrheic. And by killing the ovaries, you lower estrogen levels. So the, the effect of chemotherapy in the premenopausal patients is dual. It has a cytotoxic effect, and it also has the chemical castration effect. It kills the ovaries. And by killing the ovaries, you deprive the tumor of estrogen, and you lower the risk of recurrence. So there's a dual effect in the premenopausal. In the postmenopausal patients, of course, you don't have active ovarian function. And so the effect of chemotherapy in the postmenopausal patients is only cytotoxic. <laughs> So whereas the premenopausal is both cytotoxic, cytotoxic and chemical castration effects are in art play. In the postmenopausal patient, only the cytotoxic effect is at play. So the benefit of chemo in premenopausal patients is twice that of postmenopausal patients. Uh, and in postmenopausal patients, of course, the toxicity of chemotherapy is quite significant. So it's actually more effective. These are actually more effective regimens in the premenopausal setting than they are in the postmenopausal setting. Now, the numbers that I gave you, right, if you want to go back to the numbers, uh, sorry, 55%, 40%, 32%, 30%, 20%, 25%, right? What kind of numbers are these? What kind of numbers are these? You know, you know uh, the literature and doctors throw out numbers all the time, but what kind of numbers are these? Well, these are relative benefits. These are relative benefits, and relative benefits are talked about a lot when we talked about drug regimens for, for breast cancer. People are always talking about relative benefits. So what do we mean by relative? So let's take an example. Let's say you do a clinical trial. You've got 1,000 patients in the control arm. You've got 1,000 patients in the treatment arm, okay? And let's say you've got a great drug. You've got Herceptin, okay, which actually cuts the risk of recurrence by 55%, but let's say it's 50% for the point of your discussion. In the control arm, 200 people die. In the treatment arm, 200 people die, uh, 100 people die. So what's the relative benefit of the drug? What? It's 50%. You cut the risk of death from 200 down to 100. So you cut it by half. You cut it by 50%. So that's the relative benefit. The relative benefit is 50%. But what's the absolute benefit? 10%, because you're actually only saving 10, 100 lives out of 1,000. So the absolute benefit is 10%. The relative benefit is 50% in the example that I just gave. So you could tell the patient, this drug will lower your risk of 50%. This drug will lower your risk of, of, of death by 10%. In both cases, you'd be right. You could either tell her it's got a 50% benefit, or you could tell her it's got a 10% benefit. Both cases, you'd be right. It, would, it depends on whether or not you're talking about relative or absolute benefits. So in this scenario, the relative benefit is 50%. The absolute benefit is 10%. What ends up happening is the relative benefits get talked about a lot. Absolute benefits are not talked about much at all. Drug companies like to report relative benefits. Why? Because it's a bigger number. It makes headlines. If you say there's a 10% benefit of Herceptin, nobody's going to listen. If you say there's a 50% benefit of Herceptin, everybody listens. So the relative benefits get overreported, and patients are, I think, oftentimes misled into believing how effective a drug is. Because when you come in to see the doctor, you don't know if you're going to die or not, right? You don't, I mean, God knows you don't know. The only person that knows is God. So all you know is you're one of the 1,000 patients with breast cancer. So from your perspective, the benefit is 10%. But yet, the patients are told the benefit is 50%. So relative benefits, absolute benefits are two different ways of reporting drug treatment effects, and the relative benefits are generally overreported by doctors who perhaps don't know the difference, and by patients and by, and by, the, and by the industry.
Now, again, as I said, relative benefits are the most common way of reporting drug effects. Absolute benefits are usually underreported. And now, absolute benefit varies according to patients, according to time, okay? Number needed to treat is the third way of reporting treatment effects. And number needed to treat is one divided by the absolute benefit. So if you go back to the scenario, the relative benefit is 50%, the absolute benefit is 10%, the number needed to treat is 10, one divided by the absolute benefit. So you would need to treat 10 patients to save one life. So you could tell the patient there's a 50% benefit, there's a 10% benefit, or you need to treat 10 patients to save one life. Three different ways of reporting these treatment effects. Now, what's happening recently, okay, is that clinical trials are not reporting all-cause mortality. In other words, if you, when, when, when clinical trials are undertaken nowadays, rather than the endpoint being death from any cause, the endpoint has been death from breast cancer. So you may reduce the risk of breast cancer deaths by 30% relative benefit, and you may increase de risk of deaths from leukemia and heart attacks and stroke by 50%, and the drug will come out looking great, okay, because you have reduced the risk of death by 30%. So if, if cause-specific mortality is the endpoint, you've got to be careful when telling the patient that the drug is effective or not. So if cause-specific mortality is the endpoint, you've got to do a samba dance. You've got to look at the number needed to treat versus the number needed to harm. Number needed to treat is the number of patients you have to treat to uh, prevent one death from breast cancer. Number needed to harm is the number of treatments you have to give to, to cause one death from the, from the treatment intervention. And if number needed to treat if number needed to harm exceeds number needed to treat, then you should give the drug. If number needed to harm is less than the number needed to treat, you shouldn't give the drug. But you can avoid that samba dance by simply using all-cause mortality as the endpoint for your, for, your, for your trials. But increasingly, drug companies, others, are not doing it because it's expensive. And also, they get the result they want when they don't use it. And they don't have to call patients as long when they use cause-specific endpoint versus using all-cause mortality as the endpoint. So again, three ways of reporting, relative, absolute, number needed to treat. And if the end point of the trial is not all-cause mortality, if it's breast cancer-specific mortality, then you need to do a look at the number needed to harm as well as a separate end point. Now, let me give you a couple of examples, okay? So let's say you got a 45-year-old lady with, with a breast cancer patient. She undergoes breast conserving surgery, and her risk of recurrence is 40%. We don't use CMF anymore, but it's an easy number to report because it's a 25% relative benefit, so it's easy to work with. Let's say you give the, uh, a core of these patients the 40% risk of recurrence. Let's say you give them CMF, 25% relative benefit. What's their absolute benefit? Well, the absolute benefit becomes 25% of 40% or 10%. So relative benefit in this case is CMF, 25% benefit. The absolute benefit would be 25% of 40% or 10%. So in, in, a, in, a, in a patient with a 40% risk of recurrence, the relative benefit of CMF would be 25%. The absolute benefit would be 10%. What's the number needed to treat? Well, it's one divided by the absolute benefit. So you need to treat 10 patients with CMF to prevent one breast cancer recurrence, the scenario that I gave you. Now let's say you've got a, a group of patients, the six, you've got a patient with a 60% chance of recurrence, and you want to offer CMF. What's her, what's her, uh, what's her real absolute benefit? Well, now it would be 25% of 60%. So her absolute benefit would be 15%. Let's say you've got a patient with an 80% risk of recurrence. You offer a CMF. What's her relative benefit? Again, relative benefit would be 25%. But in this case, 80% risk of recurrence, the absolute benefit would be 25% of 80% or 20%. So you get the picture. As the prognosis of the patients gets worse, what happens to relative benefit? The relative benefit stays the same. It's constant. That's called the Cox proportional hazard assumption. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Relative benefit, they tell us the same. It stays constant, 25%. What happens to the absolute benefit? As prognosis gets worse, absolute benefit goes up. Okay, as prognosis gets worse, absolute benefit goes up. So you want to give toxic therapy to people who have bad prognosis because then the absolute benefit is going to be high and the risk of, recurrent, risk of, of side effects is going to be low. So we want to give chemotherapy, which is very toxic, to patients who are no positive and have bad tumors. You don't want to give it to patients who have good tumors because for them, the, the risk will outweigh the benefits. In patients with bad prognosis, the benefits outweigh the risk. So again, relative benefit stays constant. That's the Cox proportional hazard assumption. I'll talk about Cox in a second. And as prognosis gets worse, relative benefit stays the same, and absolute benefit goes up. And as prognosis gets worse, number need to treat goes down. So these numbers go three different ways. Relative benefit stays constant over time. As prognosis gets worse, as prognosis gets worse, absolute benefit goes up. 
As prognosis gets worse, number needed to treat goes down. So I talked about Cox. This is Cox, okay? So I, and I just Googled him last night. He's still alive. Uh, he is now 93 years old. Okay, so he's born 90. You know, every, when I talk about it, I always Google him to see if he's still, still around. But anyway, but he's 93 years old. So he's the one who kept this assumption that relative benefits are constant over time. Okay, and 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 he reported this in 1972 in a statistics journal. NSABP was started the same year. They took what he said at face value and they implemented it into every one of the NSABP trials that was ever conducted. So all the NSABP adjuvant therapy trials have with their basis, this man, David Cox's, proportional hazard assumptions. The relative benefits stay constant over time, absolute benefits change over time, depending on baseline risk. If you look at Google, that paper that he wrote is cited, actually it's now cited about 46,000 times. Huge impact, okay, it's had a huge impact. It's cited like 46,000. So the paper he wrote in 1972 has a huge impact. So David Cox's underlying premise was that relative benefits stay constant over time, absolute benefits change depending on baseline risk. And the higher the baseline risk, the greater the absolute benefit. But relative benefits always stay constant over time. That's a David Cox proportional hazard assumption. He's a professor at Cambridge University in England. Uh, and he's still alive. Now, a couple years ago, uh, when I was at, at Bethesda, uh, I was at the um, uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital, and right across the street was, was, was the National Cancer Institute. So Bill Anderson and I got together, and we looked at what's known as the hazard function. Hazard function tells you how risk of recurrences changes over time after breast cancer diagnosis. And what you see is that breast cancer has got a very dynamic risk of occurrence that's changing very rapidly. So very early on, you have a very rapid increase in risk of occurrence, and then it drops off. Okay? And, then it, then, and the ER positive and, and uh, ER negative have very different recurrence patterns. So, words, uh, so if you look at all of them, okay, that's the middle. This is the recurrence pattern. It peaks at about three years, and then it drops off. But if you look at ER positive and ER negative, they're very different. ER negative has a very high risk of recurrence early on. And then eventually, at eight years, there's a crossover where the ER negatives actually do worse or actually do better than the ER positives. So this is not proportional. Cox said relative benefits stay the same because the proportional has it. Breast cancer is not a proportional disease, all right? Based on this, it's not a proportional disease. So we're assuming that relative benefits are going to be over, uh, constant over time in a disease setting that's not proportional. There's nothing proportional about this sort of recurrence pattern. And yet we're, the underlying premise of all these trials has been the treatment effects are proportional over time. And yet there's nothing proportional at all about this recurrence pattern. So this paper was published. And then uh, I approached NSABP about three or four years ago. And I asked him, do, we, do you mind if we go back and look at the NSABB adjunct therapy trials to see if, in fact, the cost proportion has assumption holes? And since that editorial was published in the JCO, they said, sure, go ahead and look at it. And they gave me two statisticians, Zhang Zhang and Hannah Bandos. And we went back and we looked at all the NSABP trials to see if, in fact, the cost proportion has assumption was valid. Now, NSABP was started in 1972, okay, 1971. And the uh, cost has assumption uh, Cox's uh, paper came out in 1971, and, and, and the, and the uh, assumption was embedded into all the NSVP trials. Now, NSVP closed its doors officially in 2014, and it merged with RTOG, Radi Radiation Therapy Oncology Group, and GOG, Gynecology Oncology Group, to form Energy Oncology. So NSVP no longer exists, but at the time that we proposed this to NSVP, it did exist, and we went back and we looked at all 19 breast cancer adjuvant therapy trials to see if Cox proportional has assumption, what the relative benefits being constant over time was actually valid. So there were, uh, there were 19 breast cancer adjuvant therapy trials conducted between, between uh, 1972, when Cox reported the, that paper showing the relative benefits constant over time, and the start of the NSVP, and 2014 when NSVP closed its doors. There were 19 adjuvant therapy trials conducted by the NSVP. So when we did the study, we had now 20, 30 years follow-up on a lot, of these a lot of these trials. So we had ample room, ample evidence to see if, in fact, the Cox proportional hazard assumption was valid. And what we found is that the Cox proportional hazard assumption was valid in nine, I'm sorry, was valid in 10 out of the 19 trials. In nine out of the 19 trials, the proportional hazard assumption did not hold. In other words, in nine out of the 19 trials, if you follow patients long enough, the relative benefits don't stay constant over time, they change. And more often than not, what happens is the relative benefits go away after about three or four years. So you have no benefits at all. So patients are covered by these drugs oftentimes for three or four years, and then after that, there's no coverage at all. 
And in a couple of cases, what we found is that there's a delayed benefit. In other words, with Herceptin, you don't see the benefit until one year out. So if you don't follow these patients long enough, you may not see the benefit. So the point here is that the proportion hazard assumption is valid in, in most cases. In, in, in the case of the NSVP, it was valid in 10 out of 19 trials. But in many instances, it's not valid. Now, one of the things I wanted to include in this paper was an, a, 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 a suggestion. So when we say the relative benefit is 25%, we don't know if that means that 25% of people benefit all the time or 25% or of, or, or of people benefit some of the time. The other thing we don't know is if, if, the, if there's a 25% relative benefit, okay, does that mean you're simply pushing the risks of recurrences out beyond the window of the, of, the, of, the, of the trial? So in other words, you'll see a benefit of 25%, but the recurrences may occur 10, 12 years after the trial shop, uh, stops accruing patients, or after the uh, trial stops reporting patients. So that question we don't know. So, so, so validation, or if, if the proportion has an assumption holds, it may mean that you've cured the patient of the disease. If it doesn't hold, it may mean you're simply moving the risk of recurrence out further in time. So, so if the proportion has assumption holds, it may imply cure. If it doesn't hold, it may imply you're simply increasing time to recurrence and death. That's a, that's a possibility that we haven't really fully developed yet. And again, here's a, uh, I talked about uh, the uh, uh, hazard, this is the hazard, and this is the, uh, this is the uh, Kaplan-Meier, Kaplan-Meier plots are usually used to report uh, treatment effects. This is the hazard function. What you see here, what you don't see here, but you see here, this is the, the, the this is NSBP9 trial. Here you see the standard uh, without the treatment, here you see with the treatment, what you see, what you see is there's a crossover. You don't see that readily in the Kaplan-Meier plot, but you see in the, in the hazard plot. But again, Nine of the 19 trials, the proportion hazard assumption did not hold. Relative benefits changed over time. Now, one of the things I just want to emphasize again, uh, chemotherapy, getting back to chemotherapy, has toxicity. And this study in 2014 looked at toxicity of chemotherapy. Patients were hospitalized while they were getting chemotherapy. And what it found was that the, the risk of toxicity was greater in younger women, I'm sorry, in older women than it was in younger women, which you would imagine. What the study didn't point out was that there's also a very significant risk of death from chemotherapy from leukemias, from myeloblastic syndrome. So even though chemotherapy reduces your risk of dying of breast cancer, it increases your risk of dying of other things, okay? So, you, 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 so, so, so the, the, the breast cancer benefits are reported, the other things are not oftentimes reported. And so again, getting back to my point, uh, if the number needs, so, so when should you not give chemotherapy? If you're, if you're basing your premise of giving chemotherapy on a trial that's not reporting all-cause mortality, but is rather reporting only breast cancer-specific mortality, then you need to do a number need to harm, number to need, uh, treat Samba dance. If the number need to harm is less than number need to treat, you should not give the chemotherapy regimen. If it's greater, you should give it, or you can give it. Also, if the absolute benefit of chemotherapy is less than 3%, the absolute benefit of chemotherapy is less than 3%, you shouldn't give it. Because, three per, because chemotherapy carries about a 3% risk of death and harm to patients. So, so I'll give you an example. CMF, let's go back to CMF. Would you give it to somebody with a 10% chance of dying of breast cancer? No, because 25% of 10% is 2.5% absolute benefit. Your chance of dying from CMF is about 3%. You wouldn't give it to somebody with a 10% baseline risk of death from breast cancer. Now, uh, so again, endocrine therapy, uh, so adjunct therapy of breast cancer started in the 1980s, okay? What we found is that breast cancer death rates in the United States